All right, so Psalm 15, obviously a very short psalm, but um, so much to be learned in this, in this passage. This is a, a, a psalm I memorized quite a while ago. It's a great psalm, and this actually ties in really nicely with the sermon I preached last Sunday evening on um, failure is not an option. Maybe it was in the morning. I don't remember which sermon it was. Morning or evening, regardless, uh, my mind is failing me right now. But I had multiple points in that. One of them was in our walk with God and serving God. And one of my sub points in that is, is attending church. And Psalm 15, I think this entire psalm is, is, is dedicated to that, that very um, thought, that very thing is abiding in God. So look at look, verse number one about says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? In God's tabernacle or in God's house, right? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? So he's asking a question, who is going to abide, live in, stay in the house of God, remain in God's house, be solid, be grounded, be able to stay in church. If you've been in church for any number of time, especially a, like a good church that, that's preaching hard, you're hearing a lot of great doctrine, you know, the Bible is a sword, the Bible divides, the Bible divides right from wrong, sin from righteousness, and it divides people. A lot of people can't handle everything that's written in this book. So the question is, who's going to abide? Who is going to remain? Over my uh, course of, of being in church, especially being in a good church, year after year after year, you see people come and you see people go. But you also see people remain. You also pe see people stay and, and, and are faithful and are reliable and they're there week after week, year after year, decade after decade. But I'll tell you what, it's not the majority. People do come and people do go. So what can you do? How can you make sure that you are not one of these people that just is here for a while and then they're gone and then they go off into the world, then they go off and do something else. Yeah, I did that for a little while. Yeah, it was this phase. Yeah, I was real excited for a while. But then, you know, the cares of this world choked me and, and, and just got me out of church. How do I make sure, because you're here now, how do you make sure that, that's, that, that you will remain? Well, this this short passage has a lot of great wisdom to it. We're going to look at it. And it starts, the answer starts in verse number two, and it starts from within your heart. Your heart is the first place. Your heart has to be right with God. As soon as your heart turns, you could have some outward, you, you could have some outward manifestation just of routines, of habits. <coughs> People can continue attending church for a while after their heart has already turned, but I'll tell you what, it's only just a matter of time at that point. You can keep going through motions, but if you want to make sure you're going to abide, you have to keep your heart right. In verse number two, we're going to see why I'm saying that, because he says, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. All three of those things, walking uprightly, you know, working righteousness, doing good, all of those are going to stem from within your heart. If you don't have the heart to do what's right, if you don't have the heart to work righteousness or to speak the truth, you're not going to do it. We have to have our hearts ready and, and steady and, and on the Lord, and our heart has to want it, has to desire it. It's just like anything in life. Getting your heart into anything is really what's going to keep you moving forward and doing it. You know, people who, uh, on, on the flip, this is talking about something that's good, abiding in God's house, right? You, talk, you think about people who have addictions, people who struggle with sin, maybe alcoholics or drug addicts or, or any other type of addict. And we all know that if the person's heart, they may know in their mind, hey, I need to stop doing this. 
I know this isn't good to me. I talk to people, well, smoking cigarettes is a great example. How many people don't really want, you know, in their mind they know smoking cigarettes isn't good. I'm spending all this money. It's not good for me. I shouldn't be doing it, but they do it anyways. The vast majority of people, the reason why is because deep down they really don't want to quit. Now, there are some people that still struggle. I'm not going to say that's every single person. There are people that struggle that truly do desire to not do it anymore, and it's in their heart, and they really don't want to do it. But the vast majority of people, especially with the drugs and with other things, they don't want to quit. They don't want to do it. And you can never make them do it. You know, they can start going through some of the motions, but until they actually really want to quit, they're not going to. Their heart is has to be set. Their heart has to be in it in order to achieve that, in order to get through it. You want to raise godly children? Your heart needs to be in it. You have to be dedicated. You have to be devoted. You have to really want that in order to act on it. And if you really want to stay in church and if you want to make sure I am not going to be moved, I am not going to be getting out of church, I am not going to let that happen, your heart needs to be in it. You need to be looking at God's laws and loving the law of the Lord. That's why, that's how else are you going to walk uprightly? Which means you're doing the right things. God determines right from wrong. God's law tells us what we need to know about this is right and this is wrong. God's word is going to tell us this is righteousness. Your heart needs to be right in order to receive from God's word to know, hey, I'm going to be working right. I'm going to be doing what's right. Your heart has to be right, but then your heart, your, your actions need to follow. Now again, this is about staying in church. This isn't about being saved. This isn't about, you know, oh, I'm going to lose my salvation unless I do all this work. No, this is about, stay, this is about making sure you're going to stay in church. You want to make sure you're going to stay and you're going to remain and that whether hard times come or good times come, no matter what happens, I am going to abide. I am going to remain when you're doing the work, when you're not a hearer of the word only, but a doer, when you're exercising your faith, when you're actually doing things, when you're working righteousness, that will help you to remain in church. The more active that you are in a church is going to keep you in that church. Working righteousness. Think about this. If you were running a ministry in a church, if it was your job to, say, go to a nursing home every week or go to a prison or do a bus route or do, you know, whatever, whatever ministries a church is offering... Or maybe you're leading a soul winning time. You're doing work. You're working righteousness. It's going to be a lot harder for you to then just turn around and be like, well, I'm not in church this week or I'm not going to church that week because you're already being committed to things. You're already working enough and you're committing yourself to things. I couldn't imagine when I was going to church at another church or even being here, I have obligations to be here. I'm not just going to wake up on a Sunday and be like, yeah, I don't feel like going to church. What's everyone else going to do? <laughs> who's going to unlock the doors? Who's gonna, you know, there, there's so much of that. But even if you're not the pastor, but you, you start getting involved in doing things and working righteousness, it's going to be a lot harder for you to then just, just forsake all of that and get out. The more active you are, the more people are relying on you, the more responsibility that you have, the more righteousness you're working will help you to stay firm and to abide in the tabernacle. It will help you. And, and when you're doing these things, you know, again, your heart's in it. You love this stuff. You're going to be, uh, want to be around it even more. It, it feeds off of each other. The more righteousness you work, the more you're going to want to be around righteousness and, and, and be in God's tabernacle and, and be around that. It, it's, it's, this is where it all starts. Let's look at the next verse. Because every single one of these verses has a lot, a lot to it. Starts in your heart. Verse number three. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. So verse two, we have you doing right. And then verse number three is you not doing evil or wicked. And especially to other people. Every single one of these things is focused against somebody else. So 
Verse 2, you're kind of focused on yourself. I'm going to do what's right. I'm getting my heart right. My heart is going to speak the truth. I'm going to want to know what's right from God's word. I'm not going to let anything offend me because it's God's word. My heart, my heart is seeking truth. My heart is seeking to do what's right. But not only that, I'm not going to then do evil to somebody else. So you want to abide in God's house. Here's, here's a, and I love this first one because, uh, hey, Les, can you watch David? He's flipping lights over there. The first one, he that backbiteth not with his tongue. This is a big one in church. This, this does a lot of damage in churches. This one thing, this very first thing, is, an, is enough to get a lot of people out of church. You want to abide in God's house. Don't be one that's going around. And then what is backbiting? So very, very simply... The two words make a lot of sense together. Think about someone's back being to you and someone going to bite at their back, right? It's, it's something that you are talking bad about someone or maybe stabbing someone in the back, talking about them behind their back. You're doing things. You're not being upfront about it. You're not being face-to-face. -face. You're not, if you have a problem with someone, dealing with it with that person. You're going around and you're backbiting. You're going around and you're talking to, to all these other people and moving their hearts against someone else. That is backbiting and that is wicked. And you know what? You could be backbiting whether you're telling the truth or not. A lot of people like to say, oh, well, what I'm saying is true. Well, you know what? You could still be backbiting because you're just talking bad about another person behind their back. And there's no reason for that. They're not there to defend themselves. They're not there to say anything. And what good is it going to do except you just turning more people against them and sowing discord among the brethren? Proverbs tells us how to deal with that. The Bible says, an angry countenance turneth away a backbiting tongue. And that if someone comes to you in church and is backbiting someone else, you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to give them a real nasty look. You're supposed to look at them and just give them a real mean face and let them know that you're, you're discontent with what they're doing and that you're not going to participate in their backbiting and just go along with the gossiping and go along with the evil speaking of a brother or sister in Christ. Because that does a lot of damage. Because what happens then when the person finds out, oh, You've been talking about me and you've been talking about all these other people and now it's causing all these other problems. What happens as a result? People get out of church. Because why would you want to be around a group of people and everyone just going to be talking bad about you? And this happens all the time. And it's wickedness. And if you want to make sure, you know what, I'm going to stay in church. I'm going to stay right. I'm not going to backbite against anybody and I'm not going to participate in it either. It ought to have no place in the house of God at all. Backbiting with the tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor. You're not doing anything bad to your, other, to, to your neighbor, to other people, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. So you want to stay and abide in the God's tabernacle. It starts in your heart with you doing right. And also not transgressing against other people and doing harm to them or, or doing ill towards your neighbor. The Bible says, and in, in, turn if you would real quick to Romans chapter 12. A very simple verse to, to sum this up, what we're reading in Psalm 15 is what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 12. He said, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. It's a golden rule, right? The things that you want people to do to you, you do that to them. And he, he says, this is, the law, this is like a, a summary of the law and the prophets. This is how you should be living your life. And if you want to abide in church, in God's house, and in being upright, that is a mentality you need to remember. Would I want someone else talking bad about me behind my back? No? Well, then don't do that to them. Would I want someone being evil towards me or taking up some reproach against me? Oh, no, I wouldn't. Then I'm not going to do that to them. 
It's very simple, yet people have such a hard time with this concept. Actually putting it into action. We have, there's, there's so many different laws and things and, you know, written in the Bible, all these specifics. But Jesus is just like, if you could just get this down, you're going to be doing really good. Because that's what the law is all about. You know, it's, it's, you're not doing evil to other people and you're just doing what's right. Romans chapter 12, we're going to start reading in verse number 14. We're going to see again uh, another passage here describing a sim similar concept, the same thing. Verse number 14, the Bible says, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. So we have the same mind towards everybody in church, towards one towards another. We, we, we think about everyone the same way. We have the same mind. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estates. Now when it says to condescend, it doesn't mean be condescending towards somebody of like putting them down. It means bring yourself down to the same level. It means be humble. Condescend to men of low estate. So someone who doesn't have high things, a lot of riches, Maybe you do have some wealth. You know what? You need to just be able to bring yourself down to be on the same level as, every, as anyone else and not talk down to them. Be not wise in your own conceits. Verse number 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. So maybe someone does do you evil and it's not your fault. But the Bible's still telling us here what is right. This is how we walk uprightly. This is how we work righteousness. This is how you are going to remain in God's house. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Be transparent. Be above board. You are honest in the sight of everybody. There's no hidden secrets and hidden sins and, and, and all this other hypocrisy going on. You're just being honest. Verse number 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. We are not trying to cause fights and strifes and, and talking smack about people and backbiting. Live peaceably. You do your thing, let other people do theirs. And as much as is possible, you do that. We, we get here now and understand verse number 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. It is not our jobs to make, thing, to make every wrong right. It's not our job to go and seek vengeance. And oh, this person did wrong to me, I'm going to make sure they pay. That is not the attitude you will ever find one time in the Holy Scriptures that we are supposed to have. God is the one who will judge. He is the one who will bring vengeance. He is the one who's going to determine what is right. We need to remember that God is long-suffering and merciful, and we thank Him for being long-suffering and merciful towards us. And if you appreciate that, and if you appreciate that in your life, you better remember that next time someone does you wrong. And not be so quick to just want to make sure that they pay. Let God deal with it. Because God will deal righteously. And because we know that vengeance belongs to the Lord, look at verse number 20. It says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. When you do what God tells you to do, when you live the life, that God tells you to live, then when people still do wrong to you, God will have vengeance on them. He will make sure that they pay. And he's saying, as long as you just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're being nice to them and they're not being nice to you. You're blessing them. They're cursing you. You are doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're doing what's right. The more righteous that you are, the worse it's going to be for them. Now, we don't be nice to people because we just want to keep fires, <laughs> you know, coals on their head. That's not the goal because honestly, the goal is going to be maybe you can soften their heart a little bit. 
That's why it says in verse 21, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. If, you, if evil just goes back and forth, you're not going to get any good out of it. It's just going to be evil back and forth. I mean, look at, look at the, you know, as, as a real base example, look at the gangs, right? What happens in gangs? You got one group over here, you know, somewhere along the line, someone does something wrong to someone else. But now you always got this retaliation going back. Well, now you killed my friend. Well, now we got to go and kill your friend. Now you killed our friend. We got to go back and do it. And it's this back and forth and back and forth. And they can never just overcome evil with good. That's why it's always going to be evil. Because no one can just say, you know what? You did wrong to me, but I'm going to bless you for that. Think about the huge impact that would have just in that one area. If people could say, you know what, we're going to get right with God and we're going to, we're going to live a godly life or a godly example, I guarantee you the killing would stop. It would have to. Now, I'm... <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen, okay, because they have to, you know, get saved and do, you know, whatever. I hope they do get saved. You know, that, that's, what, that's what I would like to have happen, but it's an example, and, and it's something that we need to just apply in our own lives. People will do you wrong sometimes. And we need to have the attitude and the mindset that, hey, what, the way that we want people to treat us we treat them the same way. And when you have an enemy and they're cursing you, go ahead and bless them. Go ahead and do what's right. And don't be overcome of evil. Don't let the evil things come against you. Don't let that consume you to the point where you want to take vengeance in your own hands and take matters in your own hands. Let God deal with it. Cry out to the Lord. We're going through the book of Psalms. You'll, you'll realize as you go through Psalms how many times is David crying out to the Lord. Lord, my enemies are doing this. My enemies are doing that. God, I, you know, I, I can't sleep. I've got all these problems. Saul keeps coming after me. I have so much going against me, God. Will you deal with it? Because what it, we see the way he lived out his life. When, when he had the opportunity twice to kill Saul, who was after his own life, what did he do? Did he kill him? Didn't do it. He entreated him. And, and would even say, you know what? I'm not going to lift up my hand to the Lord's anointed. Not going to do it. Not going to do evil, even though he's trying to do evil to me. I'm going to overcome evil with good. That's the mindset. And that's what we need to have. And you know what? David remained in God's tabernacle. Even though he slipped and fell and had a really bad backslide when he, when he got into his sin with Bathsheba. And he had Uriah the Hittite killed. Very serious sin, and he paid for it. But you know what? He didn't get out from the house of God. He didn't get away and just let that completely get him out of God's tabernacle. His heart was in it. His heart grieved when he sinned, unlike Saul's, King Saul. King Saul didn't get repentant. He didn't get right with God. He, didn't, he didn't, um, didn't seek that. He was too full of pride. David wasn't. David was humble. He recognized his error. He saw what he did wrong. And, and his heart, he got his heart back right with God. And it started with his heart. And he still then tried to work righteousness and that's what kept him. We're gonna, as we're going to continue on through Psalm, we'll go back if you go to Psalm 15, and we're going to see the rest of this passage, what, what we need to do to keep us in God's tabernacle, keep us in church, keep us in doing what's right. Verse 4 is a big one, and, and I've got, um, we'll probably spend the majority of time just on this one verse. Because this is something that is not practiced today by and large probably more than anything else. And it's, and it's due to a teaching that has just slipped through the cracks and people have rejected over time. Let's read verse number four and look at what this verse says. And look, this is the word of God. These aren't the words of David. These aren't the words of man. This is God's word. This is the Holy Spirit who spake through the mouth of David this psalm. God's word. 
Just as much as, as for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life is the word of God. So is Psalm 15, 4. Okay? Look at verse number 4. It says, In whose eyes a vile person is contemned. That word contemned, you think of the word contempt, it means hated. You have contempt for somebody, you hate them. In whose eyes a vile person is contempt. I thought we're not supposed to hate anyone. Well, if you want to abide in God's tabernacle, it says you should hate. And look, it doesn't say the actions of a vile person. It says in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. The person is hated. Now, there's no contradiction here. Does that mean we should take vengeance against the vile person? Personally, when they do wrong? No. But you don't love them. The vile person is contemned. And I have a lot of references to the word vile because that is an important word to understand. And you know, one of the reasons why we love and use and, and hold up and steadfastly on the King James Bible and the English language being the word of God because he's preserved his words and every word is important. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live. Every word. And when we see these words, we need to understand what we're talking about here because this is an area where the vast majority of the Bible you're going to see just an overall theme or concept of loving people and doing good, right? That is an overall theme. Yet there are instances that we see here where the Bible talks about people that should be hated. And not just, at, the, 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 there's definitely a lot of, of um, scriptures that talk about sin being hated, right? Hate that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. And we ought to have that as well. Well, we hate sin. We hate things that are wicked. But there are people that also need to receive hatred. Vile is, is one of the keys here. So you can, you can write these down if you'd like, or you could, you could try to turn to them, but there's a bunch of places. I don't have every single reference. We're not going to look at every single one tonight. You can go home and do a word study on the word vile later on and you can kind of look up and see all the context. There are a couple of instances where you'll have like Job or David speaking about like being vile. But the way that the, the, the words are used is very consistent, okay? And when, when, when a believer or a say person likens themselves to something, sometimes it's very extreme. So when they're saying, like, I'm going to be real vile, it doesn't, he's not saying literally he's going to be vile as in what we're going to see the word being used as to describe. He's just being very extreme with his language, okay? Because those are the exceptions, but we're going to see a, a tremendous amount of, of usages of that word here that is the rule deuteronomy 25 verse number three this is in 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 god's law about how many uh stripes someone can receive as a punishment so 25 3 says 40 stripes he may give him and not exceed lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes then thy brother should seem vile unto thee so what he's describing is the maximum punishment for a beating, if someone has committed a crime that's worthy of being beat, you can't lash him or whip him more than four. I mean, think about 40 times. Think about receiving a whipping, and it says stripes. The reason why it says stripes is because it's talking about blood. That with every crack of the whip, with every beating that you get, you are starting to bleed. So imagine receiving 40 of those. That's a lot, right? Now, that is the limit that God put on you. Say, you know what? He's not saying that every time you whip someone, it's going to be 40 whippings. He's saying, do not go above 40. 
Because when you start, when you go above that, that, that turns into what we might call cruel and unusual punishment. That turns into something that is vile. So the word being used here, that is an extreme, that is excessive, that is just vile. I mean, you just have, like, like that is going way overboard to just whip somebody that bad. That's the way that word is being used. Okay, so keep that in mind. We're, we're talking about hating a vile person. All of these usages will help us to get the right understanding of what a vile person will look like. Okay. I would also use the term in Deuteronomy 25.3 as being unmerciful, implacable. Keep those words in mind because those words are all used in the last reference we're going to look at. Judges 19.24. Not a very pleasant story at all. Judges 19.24, if you're familiar with the story, I'll just read for you this verse. The Bible says, Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden. When the children of Belial circled the house, kind of like they did in Sodom and Gomorrah, with Lot and the angels, same story, basically. Judges 19, 24. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. What were they trying to do? There was men trying to force themselves on another man. And he's offering up women for them to have their way with, which, how wicked is that already for them to force themselves on women is extremely wicked. He says, but don't do something so vile against a man, against someone of the same, you know, that is just vile and disgusting and just way overboard. 1 Samuel 3.13. Talking about Eli's sons. The reprobates. The people that, that despised God's house, despised the offering of the Lord, were committing fornication with women in the assembly and they were stealing from God's offerings and had absolutely no respect for the Lord whatsoever and they were sons of Belial, children of the devil. So 1 Samuel 3.13 says, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. Eli's sons were considered vile because of all the things, that they, all of the multitude of transgressions that they commit, they were reprobate and they were considered vile. 1 Samuel 15, verse 9, But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. So this is talking about just animals. It's referring to... to just totally rejected animals that were just, you know, they had, they had broken limbs and whatever, you know, they had all these other problems with them, so they were considered vile and, and that the, they destroyed the vile things. Now, they were commanded to destroy everything, but they, they disobeyed God. But just for the sense of, of what we're talking about here, that word vile is being used to describe something that's rejected, that's not acceptable. Job 18.3 Wherefore are we counted as beasts and reputed vile in your sight? <clears throat> now, this is a little bit of um, extreme language being used, but the, 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 it makes sense that he's saying, look, you're, you're referring to us as being beasts, like we're dumb animals, and he's using vile as a synonym with being a beast, right, with just being an animal. Like you think we're so vile, we're like a beast. Jeremiah 29, 17. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send upon them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and will make them like vile figs that cannot be eaten. They are so evil. So it's referring to figs or fruit, right? That, that it's, it, and again, I'm not going to get into all the reason why he's talking about this because it doesn't matter. What we're looking at is the usage of the word vile. So these figs, they're so rotten. They're, they're so rotten to the cord. They're so bad. They're so evil. You can't even eat it. They're good for nothing but to be just tossed out. 
thrown away. Daniel eleven twenty one, and in his estate, this is prophetic. This is talking about the Antichrist in Daniel eleven twenty one, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So you go ahead and read all that. This is the Antichrist. He's a vile person. Now, we'll pause right here. I've got two more references. Turn, if you would, to Romans 1. But for the people that want to say, I don't think we should hate anyone. First of all, that is contradicting what we saw in Psalm 15, 4. Who shall abide in thy tabernacle, Lord? In whose eyes a vile person is contemned. A vile person is hated. A vile. So we're, going, we're taking the time to go through the word vile because it is important. Because we need to identify who needs to be hated. Because it's not everyone. It's actually a very small minority of people. But it's still a group of people that needs to be hated by somebody who is righteous in the eyes of the Lord. But if you think about this, Daniel eleven twenty one is talking about a vile person. Do you really think we should love the Antichrist? Is any believer today going to say, oh no, we should love him? No, you shouldn't love him. He's going to be persecuting and martyring and killing the saints. He is against God, against Christ. He's trying to prop himself up as God and deceiving many and trying to get people damned to hell by making them take the mark of the beast. No, you don't love him. You hate him and you pray that God destroys him and he brings his judgment against him. That's what you do to that guy. You don't love him. We don't just love everybody. We love the vile person. The Antichrist is a great example of someone who is vile. The Bible says very clearly he's a vile person. Nahum 3.6 says, And I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile and will set thee as a gazing stock. Abominable filth covering somebody, that's vile. Romans 1. Let me get there myself. Romans 1. Verse number 26 is as the, the reference to vile. But we're going to start reading a little bit a little bit earlier than that. Verse number 21 is where we'll start reading. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image of made like the corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. This is talking about sodomites. This is talking about homosexuals. This is talking about faggots. This is talking about queers. This is talking about whatever word you want to hear that's going to let you understand what we're talking about here, that that is not natural. That is not normal. Not only that, it's vile. It is disgusting. It is something that an animal would do. It is not something that people should do. It is something that is utterly rejected. It is something that is to be hated. They knew God. They glorify him not as God. And they became vain. Their foolish heart is darkened. And then God gives them up. They gave up on God. They wanted nothing to do with God. So God says, fine. You want nothing to do with me? I'm going to have nothing to do with you. And he lets them go to do whatever vile things that they're going to go off and do. Our flesh, physically, we are not drawn to doing vile things. We have a sinful nature, no doubt about it, very easily proved from Scripture. 
But when God gives somebody up and he gives them over to a reprobate mind, a rejected mind, something that he's done, he says, this is vile, I'm done with you. Throwing them away. That's when the vile things come out. And what's described as vile here is men with men and women with women. Now, that's not the only thing that's vile, but that is definitely vile. Now, we see the attributes of the people that are given up by God later in the chapter. Look at verse number 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, again, it was their choice. God didn't just pick and choose people to become reprobates just on a whim. They made that choice. They didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. They wanted nothing to do with them. God gave them over to reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters. Well, backbiters, we've seen that somewhere. Haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. Look at these last two words, implacable, unmerciful. Someone receiving a lot of beatings way more above than, than what you would even, you, you start looking at it and be like, that is vile. That's the sodomite for you. When it boggles your mind to hear about the cases like Jeffrey Dahmer or John Wayne Gacy, it really shouldn't be that much of a surprise. Why? Because they're filled with all of these things. They are implacable. They are unmerciful. They are full of murder and debate and all this stuff. All, all wickedness. All manner of sin. They're full of it all. God's given them up. They are vile. It's okay to hate them. And not only is it okay, we should hate them. Hate it. We're not tolerant of it. We hate it. We're intolerant of it. I want to abide in God's house. I want to abide in God's good grace. I am going to hate the vile person. They are contemned in my eyes. I hate them. And I'm not going to let this wicked world brainwash me into showing any love for them. Let's go back to Psalm 15. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of a, of a better, just, uh, we went through the vast majority of the times the word vile is used. Again, go, I'm, not, I'm not trying to misrepresent the word. I've already stated that there are a few other examples that, that, that is using vile that, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's people using it. It still is, it means the same thing, but they're just, they're, they're applying it to something that's, you know, to themselves or to someone else in a way that's just extreme language, like hyperbole. But we understand what the word is meaning here and what it's showing. Hopefully that helps give you the picture of what the Bible means when it says a vile person is contemned. Verse number, let's finish the rest of that verse number four. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. So this is talking about having righteous judgment. Being on the right side. Right? You, you hate the vile person, but you exalt or you lift up or you honor the righteous, them that fear God, those that love God's commandments and they fear the Lord. That's who you should be honoring. But what happens today? You've got believers in Jesus Christ that are taking the side of the vile person and they're on the attack against the person who fears the Lord and is trying to contemn the vile person. And people are getting it backwards. Even God's own people are choosing the side of the vile person and saying, oh no, we got to love them. No. 
but I'll be hated by them because I'm just trying to fear God and keep his commandments. This isn't popular preaching, but it's what the Bible says. I challenge anybody to use scripture to say that the Bible doesn't really mean what it actually says. That you actually shouldn't be hating a vile person. Yet, yeah, good luck trying to convince me otherwise because I know what God's word says. You're not going to be able to find it. You could show me all kinds of verses about loving people. And look, we already referenced them today. Even within the context of Psalm 15, it still makes sense. God wants us to love our enemies. He wants us to do what's right. That's not a new teaching for the New Testament. But he's giving us all of the information so that we are balanced properly. We're not going and taking vengeance. We're not taking matters in our own hand. We are overcoming evil with good. Psalm 15 gives us all the same information. We're going to walk uprightly. We're not going to backbite with our tongue. We're not going to do evil to our neighbor. We're not going to take up a reproach against our neighbor. But we are going to hate the vile person. We're going to do good. We're going to walk uprightly. But we're going to hate the vile person. It's righteous judgment. And righteous judgment means you're not on the side of the sodomites because they are vile. Last verse, Psalm number 15, verse number 5, the Bible reads, He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. Usury is something that I think a lot of people, they don't even know what the word means because it's not just commonly used. But the, the, the word that we would use today instead of usury is interest. Interest. So when it says you don't put out your money to usury, it means you're not giving somebody a loan and then tacking interest on top of that for them to pay you back more than you lent unto them. People say, well, people, that happens all the time, man. That's just the way the world we live and everything. It's wicked. Okay, now, let me put a caveat in there because God's law explains this more in depth and I'm not going to get into all the details of it tonight, but it's wicked when, like your brothers in Christ, when you're, your brethren, you don't charge interest to someone else in church. Now, God allowed for, for usury to be taken upon the heathen, upon the, just the, the heathen people that was acceptable, but not among his people. He says, you don't do that among your people. And he allowed that because there were people who were tribute to them, that they should have just been destroyed anyways, but they still lived among them and, and, and all that. And he's saying, you know, for them, that was acceptable according to God's law. But when it comes to, you know, if someone at church is in need, you got a brother or sister that's, that's, that's on hard times. You don't go and then say, oh, here, I'll help you out. You can, I'll lend you some money. Just you know, pay me back when you get it. But just remember, you know, that's 5% every, every month or something, you know, whatever. That's, that's usury. That's, you're making a gain off of them in their hard times and it's wickedness. And that, is, that should not be tolerated. So we don't do that here. We don't practice that here. Um, or it says, nor taketh reward against the innocent. So, <coughs> he that doeth these things shall never be moved. Who's going to abide in that tabernacle? The person that gets their heart right and, and starts doing righteousness and, and doing good works and and loves the truth and really in their heart wants to know the truth and is, is yearning for that, starting with the heart, treating other people well, not causing problems, not backbiting, you know, again, doing good, treating other people the way that you'd want to be treated, being able to have righteous judgment. 
siding with the side of righteousness and not siding with the side of the vile and the wicked person, but rather hating that and having a proper hatred of, of the wickedness that needs to be there. And then finally, you know, being wise with our money, you know, being able to help people out, not, not exacting money, more money from them and taking usury and taking reward against innocent people and all this other stuff. He says, you, you could, if you could follow these simple, these simple things, he says, you'll never be moved. That will help to keep you in God's tabernacle. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you for so much, all the, the, the great truths that we could find in your, in your words. And even in such a, a short passage like this, there's so much to learn from, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us all to just have a, a, a sincere love for the truth for your words, that we won't allow preconceived notions, we won't allow influences from, from the world or, or something outside of your word and to, to skew or warp or, or pervert our understanding of what's right and what's wrong, that we can go solely to your words and, and to receive the truth from your words. And, um, and we love them, dear Lord, and we, I'm sure that everyone here would agree with me that we want to abide in your tabernacle and, and we just pray that you would please help us to, to find the strength and to, to do what's right, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.